Praise the Lord. We want to welcome everyone who's watching us online. Praise the Lord. We thank you and we bless you. Amen. Thank you all those for watching. I see Brother Mose nice and early on it. God bless you, brother. Uh, we've been doing we've been doing some work at the retreat uh, that we had with some of the leaders this weekend. So continue to pray for us as we work on the new steps and direction of, uh, of house of worship. And, and we see a bright future, a future that's bright, a future that's going to not only save, but contribute to the lives of thousands of people. And I believe God is going to do, do it in our lifetime and we're going to be able to see it. And the inheritance that our children are going to see is going to be something beautiful and something wonderful to behold. I really believe that you haven't really lived life until you either have fought a good battle and won or have really lived out your purpose in God. Amen. When God calls you to do something and you do it with all of your heart, there is a sense of satisfaction that cannot be matched by anything else. You can reach heights in your career, you can get promotion after promotion, but somehow or another, all you get is money. They keep promoting you and all they can give you is money. Maybe they can have an awards banquet and give you a trophy that they bought at awards.com or something like that and engrave your name on it and give you a pat on the back. But that is the most that they can do. Man, but there, when there is an award that comes from heaven, when there is a word that says, my good and faithful servant, you have done well, enter into the rest of your Lord. Yeah. It's just, there is nothing that compares to that feeling of wholeness and completeness because only God knows how to make a person satisfied from within the world knows how to present things and then sell you on it and then convince you that if you have this thing you will be happy sadly only to find out that once you believe the advertisement you will get the thing and realize this does not make me happy because only what can make you happy is that thing that connects with the thing that you are made of and only God knows what you are made of are you hearing what I'm saying and so buy what you will get the promotion that you will do all that you can on the earth while the earth is available to you but lay up treasures for yourselves in heaven yeah lay them up because nobody can steal it the rust can't take over it. It cannot be corrupted, cannot be corroded. It cannot be taken away. Well, do, in all you're doing, the Bible says in all you're getting, get an understanding. It is our time to start to understand where the real value is and start to add value to our lives and the lives of others. Because once you, once you are either sick, cannot move, have a broken ankle or something like that, and you're laying in the bed and you have to take account of what you have done only the things that you have done in the Lord are the things that are going to shine amen and so if you have a family it is your obligation to raise them in the Lord if, if you if you woke up on a Sunday morning and you can stand up on two feet get yourself in the service of the Lord I'm so thankful for those that woke up this morning and they feel an obligation to log on and they said I gotta be there I gotta connect to those people in that room because I feel God has a plan for my life. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. We have, I want to, uh, next week we have a, a special event that is happening after service. We want to invite you to uh, uh, have some ice cream with us and some coffee and perhaps some bubble tea or whatever have you and to just fellowship with us. Uh, we're going to be at Groundworks Cafe uh, in Nutley. We'll have the flyer up. Amen. Some of you have uh, have visited us already there before, but we want you to go ahead and come out. Bring your kids. We're having a back to school event. Uh, we're going to have a little uh, surprise for your kids and for all the students that are going back. Uh, we're going to be sponsored by some wonderful companies that are going to help us to put all of this together. Amen. Uh, and so, yeah, next week from four to eight uh, p.m. We're going to be there. If we have to be there later, it's fine. You know how fellowship folks do. We say we're going to end at one time and we end up, you know, three hours later, but it's all good. Amen. Are we ready for that? Praise God. And of course, the greatest announcement is that Jesus is here. 
and he has given us his blessing and his grace. Uh, we want to transition into tithes and offerings in a time of giving in the service. I don't know if you're excited about that, but I am. <laughs> giving is a moment that we can measure our faithfulness. Uh, we can check to see where we're at uh, in, in, our home, in our humility, in our organization. Amen? Amen. That which belongs to the Lord belongs to the Lord. When they asked Jesus about taxes, Jesus uh, asked them to grab him a fish, and out of the fish he took two coins. And he asked him, he said, Who, whose face is on this? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, well, go ahead and render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's, but give to God what belongs to God. And I believe with everything in me that in our personal finances that we are blessed because God is in direct control over, over the output of our lives. Amen? I don't care what you say. Your job is not just a job. You are there as a vehicle for the kingdom of God. You are there to follow our instructions. You are there to be the eyes and ears of the Lord Jesus, to bless those that need to be blessed, to protect those that need to be protected, to pray for those, to keep them in mind. You know, sometimes the Lord will put you in a job and you don't even have to talk to the person you're praying for. Sometimes God will just make you act as a guardian angel, right? In the background, spiritually assigned to cover somebody in that place. And I don't know about you, but that has tremendous value, okay? There are times I want to tell you that before you serve the Lord, if God had plans for you and he knew that you were going to come to him eventually, there were people that were assigned in your life. Maybe they didn't tell you, but you, you got to admit, you felt some kind of protection, some type of way. Have you ever, before you came to the Lord, said, you know what, I don't know what happened, but I feel like I can't believe I got away with that. I, I can't believe I didn't, I avoided that accident. I can't believe that catastrophe just passed right over me. It's because God had people looking out for you. And now it's your turn. It is your turn to look out for other people by faith. Amen. And sometimes with words you will preach but oftentimes without any words you will spread the gospel of Jesus Christ by your composure by your actions by the things that you inspire other people to do so let's give together amen if you have if you need an envelope raise your hand we'll get an envelope to you uh, if you have your phone and you want to give through that it's easier you can text to give by texting how nj h o w n j to 77977 if you have the application, uh, you can give through the app, and some of you are already uh, set up to do it. Amen? So let's go ahead and let's do that now. Let's do it as a family together. Thank you, Jesus. If you're watching online, I want you to be encouraged to go ahead and give. Uh, you might not be able to grab an envelope, but you can give electronically, and God will value it just the same. You know, sometimes it's easy to just watch online and be like, well, they ain't watching. Well, it ain't about us watching. It is about the benefit of the connection that you have with God. Amen. And I think that's valuable. If you come and you watch the service later uh, and we're not even live, but you watch it later, it's still up to you to follow through on what God has given. Now, if you know the Lord, then you already know how this works. You have reaped the benefit of the consistency. Man, there's times, folks, that we have to make financial sacrifices to get ahead. And we have nothing but faith to hold on to. Lord, I got to make the sacrifice. I'm going to make this investment, but if I make this investment, I might have nothing else. And I'm afraid that I'm not going to get my money refilled. But I'm going to pray today for refills. Let me explain what refills means. Every now and then I'll throw some words. I don't know what I'm talking about. When I say refill, just like you have an empty pitcher of water and you go ahead and put more water in it so it can not run out because you're thirsty, I believe that God can bless us with financial refills. I believe there has been some sacrifices that you have made to help your son, to help your daughter. There has been sacrifices that you have made to help your family get ahead. And some of your finances have dwindled because of those sound investments. I want to dedicate this prayer and this time of giving to a holy refill. Father, I pray right now that you may refill every bank account that, that has been depleted because it was able to help somebody else. 
every fund, every emergency fund that was used to bail somebody out. Every time we had to invest in our future to make sure that our family was going to be okay. Every dime that we have spent to help somebody else because we did it in good faith. I pray, Lord God, for refills right now in the name of Jesus refills or God not the same amount that we gave but that you may give us double for our trouble I pray Lord God that you may give us triple Lord God for all the things that we have had to come out because we were faithful I pray Lord God that we may have more than enough not just for us but that every refrigerator may be full that every bill may be paid that every rent that every mortgage may be paid on time this month and that you may give us, O oh God, financial favor and refill, O oh God, these accounts. Let it come, Lord God, through checks in the mail. Let it come, Father, through settlements. Let it come, Lord God, uh, through bonuses, through finding money, through however, Lord God, we can do it. Let it refill in the name of Jesus. If folks, O oh God, owe us money and they forgot about it, let them remember us right now that the blessing of the Lord may be upon us so we may continue to be givers and investors and helpers as you have called us to be. I pray, Lord God, for this refill to happen, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Let it be so. We believe in you, Lord God. And now, Father, I pray, Lord God, for every job, for every business, for every career. I pray, Lord God, for every student, for all of us, Lord God, that are busy in doing, Lord God, this week. Bless our doing. Bless the work of our hands. Let the work of our hands, O oh God, be potent, Lord God, and be effective for the things that we're about to do this week. Bless us, O oh God, and we will be blessed. We thank you, Lord God, for your abiding joy. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to provide for our families. Help us, O oh God, to get better and more secure each and every day as we live this life with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, let's get into the word. Give somebody a high five, a handshake, a touch on the shoulder and welcome them into the service. Amen. While you're doing that, I want you to grab your Bibles and or turn them on. Turn or swipe to Mark chapter seven. We're going to be starting at verse number one. Mark chapter 7. I like, I'm going to be reading out of the, uh, the ESV. I have an appreciation for Mark because uh, the book of Mark is one of the, uh, though it is one of the, um, the gospels, the synoptic gospels, he has many of the same stories, but his, I can appreciate his brevity. Mark was a, not necessarily one of the key uh, apostles, but Mark was a disciple that worked directly with Peter. And so his accounts of the things that happened came through Peter. And so when you read the letters of Peter, uh, it is not the gospel of Peter, but, but if, you, if you would uh, accept this understanding that Mark is almost the gospel of Peter because it is according to Peter's account of the gospel. Amen. And so uh, in line with Peter's uh, uh, character, where he, he Peter's the kind of guy that gets to the point. Mark also has taken on his character and he kind of gets to the point. So his storytelling ability is is a little uh, quicker. And so he uses words like straightway and immediately. Uh, and, and so it's it's kind of a, a pleasure to see the differences in how the writers write their stories. And all these things are important for us because we can relate not only to the stories, but relate to the authors as well. In Mark chapter 7, we're going to read here a story where Jesus is battling with the Jewish traditions. He, he is carrying about his day, and he is confronted about what the disciples are doing with their meal plan. He is confronted about how they are eating. They had certain customs, and we're going to read it. Because today I want to talk about uh, uh, certain things that happen to us and how we can change things on the inside. But before we can change, we have to understand what does God consider change? What does he consider to be good? And what does he consider to be uh, defilement? Defilement is an interesting word because it's not a word that we use often in our language. 
But defilement in their times means to dirty something, to pollute something. That there was something that is considered pure, and then you have done a blatant act to corrupt that thing. Amen? So Jesus is now talking, uh, is, is going to talk after he's confronted. Now, let's take a look at this confrontation in Mark chapter 7, out of the ESV, starting at verse number 1. When you have it, say amen. amen. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honor me with their lips, but with their heart they are far from me. In vain do they worship, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, now he's about to give an example. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you have gained from me is Corbin, and explains that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your own tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. He is talking to his own people being born a Jew, and now he is addressing the Jewish population uh, from their leadership, the scribes and the Pharisees. And he's, he is telling them to their face how they twist history, how God has given them a clear commandment to honor their mother and their father. He didn't ask them what they thought about it. He simply asked the people of Israel. He had given this command through Moses, one of the Ten Commandments. Very simple commandment. It seems simple enough. But they found a way because somebody apparently was inconvenienced by it. Perhaps they had parents that were unfair. Perhaps they had parents that uh, were a little bit, a uh, little too much, little extra little dramatic. And somewhere or another, they finagled a way to try to make it look godly, but it really, really wasn't. And the change that they made wasn't a big change. It was a little change. And, and it was a confrontation. Well, I'm gonna re basically, I'm going to respect you, and I'm going to honor you when you honor me. And that little change, the Lord called them hypocrites. Because you're asking my disciples to hold fast to a tradition that you made up. And you're holding people accountable to things that you made up. But the things that I originally said, you are abandoning them to the side. And so in verse 15, verse 14, he called the people again to him and said, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that is going into him that can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. So he stops talking to the Pharisees because this is a leadership conversation. This is not a conversation that the people even know what is going on. So he's talking to them. He rebukes them, calls them hypocrites. And then because of their teaching... They have messed people up. I don't know about you, but have you ever been messed up by a teacher that taught you the wrong thing? Have you ever been influenced by someone who, when you found out how they really live, they're hypocritical in their application of what even they say? And Jesus had pointed this out, that some of them put yokes on people that they themselves could not even bear. And this is, this is a huge problem in the church 
Because this kills the longevity of the believer. I believe with everything in me that a believer's, that the leadership of any church, their first responsibility is to the longevity of the believer. And one of the things that makes it hard for us to stay in this Christian lifestyle for a long time satisfied is when we try to do things that don't come natural to us. That when we feel like we have to be this certain character or this certain type of holy, usually is because we have been given man-made rules. We have been given man-made dress codes and man-made uh, 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 protocols because people have this mindset of how things should be and so they create a box and they say, if you want to be part of this, you have to be in this box. Now, there are certain things that I believe are good to have as rules. Okay, I think it's fine if you say no chewing gum in a sanctuary. After all, chewing gum, if you have nowhere to put it, you're going to stick it somewhere. It's going to be on somebody's shoe or the carpet, and it's going to cost money to get that thing out. Or when we move the chairs, there's nothing nastier when we say, hey, guys, let's move the chairs so we can have a, maybe prepare the space for dinner. And you go and grab a chair, and you, you have the Spirit of God, and you grab some nasty wet gum right under the chair. There's nothing that will get you out of the Spirit than someone's chewed gum under a chair. And so you got to understand, we got to have some rules, okay? No coffee in the sanctuary. We got to have some rules because somebody has to clean that up if it spills. So rules are good, but when they are spiritual rules that cannot be, that are supposed to be applied everywhere, we have to be very careful what we transition from a man-made good idea into a spiritual law. And so they didn't call them laws, they called them traditions. Your disciples don't hold on to the traditions. I believe the greatest traditions that we can have are traditions of fellowship. I think fellowship is a wonderful tradition, but tradition is not of, of fellowship isn't a man-made tradition. It is something that is given by God. He's the one that has educated us that he puts the parts of the body together for the purpose of us edifying one another. The Bible writes and says how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell in unity, that we are able to cross pollinate each other and cross inspire each other, cross motivate each other because you have something that I don't have. I don't, I don't have to work on my weaknesses. I can work on my strengths because the thing that I'm weak in, you're strong at. And as long as we are together and we are a team, I can have your back and you can have mine and we can walk together without stressing ourselves, trying to be something that we are not, trying to be good at something we are just not good at. Does that make sense? And in that way, we are alleviating stress. We are alleviating this imposter thing in our lives so we don't have to be someone that we are not. Guess what happens when you don't have to be someone that you are not? Your anxiety goes down. Your level of stress goes down. And you don't have to be an actor all the time. You can actually be yourself. And you know what I found? Which is shocking. We never get tired of being ourselves. Amen. Unless yourself is toxic. When you are toxic... You get sick of yourself. When you act on toxic behaviors, you will find yourself looking at the mirror and say, I am sick of you. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I'm sick of you. Because there are things that you are trying to change, but in not changing them, you keep hurting yourself and you become toxic to yourself. Amen? Amen? But the proper way in order for us to, to, be, to have longevity in the gospel is to find a way to please God without having to become something that is toxic to myself. And, I, and then there is such thing, I'm sorry to say it, and I'm going to say it, there is such thing as toxic Christianity. It got quiet real quick. <laughs> Did I say something wrong? There is such thing as toxic Christianity. Toxic Christianity is where you are doing what Jesus is trying to fight, describes in the hypocrites, where you put the tradition of men, the teaching of men, you put the habits of men, even church culture above Jesus culture. 
and we force each other to be this type of person instead of appreciating individuality. And in not appreciating, in, appreciating individuality, we become toxic because we, we chokehold God's uniqueness from one person to the next. And we say, this is the model Christian. We all have to be like this guy. Or sisters, you all have to be like her. And the problem is, no one can be like anybody else. And if we kill who you are, we already have one of this. Why do we need more of anything? How many gallons of milk do you need in your refrigerator? How many apples do you need? How much of the same deli do you need? You get my point. Your refrigerator is not full of one food. You don't have one ingredient. Okay, When you go to season your meat, you have a multitude of things. And in the mixture of it, and it ain't the same. You don't put the same amount of salt as you do uh, adobo. Okay, You don't put the same amount of parsley, perhaps, as you do of carrots. You're not going to put the same amount of cilantro as you do of garlic. Okay, or else you're going to be some real bad breath around here. <laughs> Too much of anything isn't good, but when you have a combination of things, it becomes good. It becomes toxic when we say we all must be one thing. The only thing that God asks us to do is to have one spirit. But even, watch this, even when the spirit hits the room, it does different things in, all, in every person. Even when the word of God hits, as I am preaching, it is doing different things to different people. No, no one person is going to walk out with the exact same revelation as the person next to you. You're going to come out with different experiences because the word has to mix with your faith. And it has to mix with your context. And it has to mix with your life and your situation, which means everyone's going to walk out with something different. Yet it is the same God that works all in all. But when we try to force everyone to have the same mindset and the same revelation, we become toxic because it isn't real and it isn't going to last. At some point, someone's going to say, you know what? I'm sick of this. I can't do this anymore. I can't be like these people want me to be. I can't look like they want me to look. I have my own individual style. I have this individual thinking. And then you're going to try to find a place that is going to be the place that is going to... ease who you are and then that's our mistake because we cannot go to where God has not sent us and this becomes a problem because how, what do I do when um, God has not authorized me to move somewhere else but I don't feel appreciated I don't feel my individuality and then we force each other because you're supposed to be there. You're in the right place at the right time. But some people aren't doing what they're supposed to do. And that requires us to pray. It requires us to call upon the spirit of God. Because just because you don't like what's happening doesn't mean you get to abandon me because you don't like what I'm doing. I'm sorry to say it. You might not like me. But if God called you to be with me, you got to stay with me. And just like I got to put up with your nonsense, every now and then, you might have to put up with mine. I'm just saying. We like it when it's one way. The guys at the front, they're wrong. Yeah, but sometimes you're wrong. Because we're all made of the same biological material. And so if we have to tolerate one way, then we all have to tolerate each other. And if I'm not allowed to abandon you, maybe, I'm just saying maybe, you're not allowed to abandon me. This is the whole problem with honoring your mother and your father. That it forces us that even though you do not like what God is saying, he's not asking you to like it. He's asking you to complete it for his purpose, which is greater than your little situation that is uncomfortable in your life. Does that make sense? Can we go deeper in this? So now Jesus explains to them, hear me all of you and understand that there's nothing outside of a person that is that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when they had entered the house, they left the people and the disciples asked him about the parable. And they said to him, 
then are you? They, 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 they ask him to explain the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside can defile him, cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of men, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. See, the Jewish leaders had figured that if we just do these traditions, cleaning our hands before we eat, that we are not dirty on the inside. And he said, no, 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 that's not how you clean the inside. You have to clean the inside by checking what comes out of you. How, how and when do we know when things come out of us? Let's get into that for a little bit. Because I think it's interesting for us to understand that, first of all, we live a life with pressures and deadlines. And when we are met with a certain pressure in life, with a certain situation, there's, there's certain things as normal, average, every day. Have you ever been having a nice day, wonderful day, and then bad news comes? That alters your flow. Or you're driving and somebody does some behavior that gets you upset. Right? Maybe beeps at you when, when you took just half a second and the light was red and it turned green. Have you ever got annoyed because people try to hurry you and rush you? Right? And you felt like getting out of your car and giving them peace of your mind and, and having them explain themselves or something worse. We, we suffer road rage. Okay? Have you ever, have you ever uh, been, had your eye in a parking spot and, and, and you know that the person caught eye contact with you and they knew that was your spot, even though there's no such thing as your spot because you don't own the property that you're about to park on? And then the person cuts you off and gets in there and they disrupt your pattern, they disrupt your flow. And now you go into fight mode over a parking spot and you feel that you have been disrespected you don't even know this person, but you have judged that they have disrespected you because they took your spot. What do you do? What do you do when you're confronted? What do you do in your job when you are threatened? What, what happens in different situations when life puts a squeeze on you? What comes out? And this is what Jesus is trying to explain to them, that it is not what, what, what you put in. It is what comes out when you put the squeeze on it. Jesus is the one that taught us that, that how you're going to know who is a false prophet, who is a false teacher, who is a false believer. He said, by their fruit, they shall be known. That once you taste what comes out of their mouth and their aura and their attitude, then you have very little investigation to do. By their fruit, you shall be known. That's why Proverbs tells us that a wise man talks once, listens twice. I'm paraphrasing. But he's going to listen way more than what he speaks. This is the, this is the attitude of a humble leader. I, I, I know a lot, but I'm going to let you talk. Because before I say anything, I want to have the benefit of summarizing, but I also want to let you ramble. Sometimes you ought to be more excited about listening than telling a story. Your story can be told at any time. But when you're meeting someone new, you have to let them speak so you can see what fest out of them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And when you speak, don't just speak because you're excited, start rambling. I, I, let me put it this way. Have you ever got upset at yourself because you talk too much? You say, why, why, why did I go on rambling? And then you realize you probably said something that you didn't have to say, or you divulge information that you could have held for later, or maybe a bargaining chip 
Because especially if, you, if you're if you doing a sales transaction, that salesperson going to let you ramble about how much you love this car. And they kind of gather all this information so they can use it to push you into a decision. It's because by our fruit, we are known. And when we get excited, we blabber. When we get in trouble, we blabber. When we get pressure put on us, it isn't that we blabber, but attitudes come out. If you're a man, the first thing that comes out when pressure, we are tempted with anger. Okay? How many of us, how many brothers have perfected anger? <laughs> brothers, has anyone had to give you a lesson on how to be angry? You ever had a class on anger? Hey, if you want to be angry, this is, let me give you 10 steps on how to be really angry. No, we instinctively know what to do. We, will, we get tight, we curl our hands, and then we start doing things that we will regret later. Because it, push, it bypasses anger, will bypass all of your sensors that say, this doesn't make sense. I'm going to have to pay for this later. I'm going to have to fix this if I break it. When you're calm, you ain't breaking nothing because a rational mind says, if I break this wall, I got to fix it. I'm not going to do that. Okay? Consequences come when I just start throwing things around, especially if it's not my stuff. So let me just chill. But once you are, when you let the anger spirit hit in, all of a sudden it bypasses consequences. Forget manslaughter. Forget that if I punch this person in the face and they pass out and they fall on the sidewalk and they crack their head on the curb, I can go to jail for manslaughter. Forget the consequences because when, when, when you get into the state of mind where you black out, consequences are bypassed. Rational thinking is gone. And many times we succumb to these things because we lose control. How many say amen to that? Have you ever lost control? If you lose control, say amen. amen. Now say I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. It's important for us to have this conversation because this is, this is important to us. I want you to go to James chapter 3. <clears throat> James chapter 3, starting at verse number 1. Look at what this says. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that you who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For, with, for we all humble, uh, we all stumble in many ways. But if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. Listen to what he just said. If anyone does not stumble in what he says... He's perfect. What did Jesus say? That it is what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. So he's saying if what comes out of you ain't never wrong, you're perfect. Because the fruit of you is clean. Let's go deeper. Able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. How they are so large and are driven by strong winds. They are guided by very small rudder. Who, wherever, uh, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For by every kind of beast and bird of reptiles and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man... No human being can tame the tongue. No man can tame the tongue. No human being can. You know what I'm saying? We have tamed lions. We have controlled tigers in a circus. You have seen it. Animals that will kill somebody with one swipe. We can make them juggle. You can make a bear. I've seen a bear juggle, y'all. 
I seen a bear go on a giant ball back and forth like this. How do we make a bear obey commands and go fetch? A pit bull that can bite your arm off, you can make it turn around and give your belly. Give his belly to you. We can control these things. But the Bible's saying, but that little tongue you got. That little tongue you got. We can make elephants tame and bow down. We can control horses. We can make airplanes and control them in the air. But that little tongue you got. Nobody can control it. When that thing says, Woo! start shooting fire and bullets everywhere without thought of consequence or repercussion. Hmm. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear leaves or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Who is wise in the understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and self-ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits. Impartial and sincere and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Did you ever consider your mouth to be so powerful? Look at somebody say, tell them, keep talking. Keep talking. This ain't a time for the church to be quiet. This is just a time for us to learn how to control that little tongue we got. Because if God has called us to his grace, he has invited us into the family of believers and we have become part of the body. It is so that you can talk. It's so that you can deliver joy to people. It is so that you can deliver peace to people. Now, look, every now and then you're going to mess up and say something crazy. Every now and then you're going to have to apologize for what you said, but it doesn't mean you stop talking. Because the way that we change is not just by us saying, well, let me, let me pray and then let me let the Lord clean my heart. And I think, let's read Psalms. I want to go to Psalms 51 because David did give us a recipe on how to clean up. Let's go to Psalms 51. Give me Psalm 51. Amen. Are you learning something today? Thank you, Lord. I see y'all online. Let me see what y'all are saying. Amen. Kobe said amen. Gladys said that's good. Jen said yes. Keep God's purpose at the forefront. Amen. I see y'all. Amen. That's good. Okay, good. Y'all listening. Y'all paying attention. Okay. I know y'all online be, you know. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes you're online, you got a tendency to multitask. You're watching and you're doing a hundred things at the same time. It's good. That's why, that's why I encourage people to comment because commenting keeps you into it. Psalms 51, verse 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold with a willing, uphold me with a willing spirit. Then teach, then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Yes, he says, squeeze me. And what's going to come out of me is going to be praise. There's going to be moments that, that you're going to be squeezed in different situations. Sometimes it isn't, uh, it isn't that you open your mouth because you are praising God. Sometimes you open your mouth because pressure and conflict is happening. That's why our job as believers is to take these moments that we come to church, we read the Bible, and fill yourself. Fill yourself. Fill yourself. Fill yourself with as much word as you can. Fill yourself with as much good song as you can. Fill yourself with as much goodness. Why? Because when the squeeze comes, what comes out is what you have been constantly exposed to all week. If you continuously fill your heart with songs that, that, that contribute violence and arrogance and pride, and you continue to consume content that is not holy, and your mind is constantly seeing things that isn't good for your soul and is toxic, when you get squeezed, what do you think is going to come out? When somebody gets on your nerves. Instead of you trying to check on the person, man, what's wrong with you? You ain't supposed to be like that. All of a sudden, you match them at their same level. And that is not what a believer is supposed to do. We are not called to match the energy of the world. We're called to come with our own energy and change the dynamic of conversations. We're supposed to be the equalizer of our environments. So when we walk into an environment, it is supposed to step up to where we are. We're not supposed to step down to where everyone else is. If you walk into a room and everybody's depressed, you're supposed to bring up the room. If you're in a room where it's full of ignorance, you're supposed to bring wisdom to the room. Everyone ought to feel brighter and smarter when you leave because you have become the equalizer. And instead of you feeling drained, you won't feel drained because as soon as you give of what's in you, the Bible says, freely you have received, so freely give. Because once I give all that I have, Soon as I leave that place, God will fill me with more. That's why the apostle writes in Philippians, whatever things are pure, whatever things are just, whatever things are righteous, think on these things. In other words, consume the righteousness of God. Consume the peace of God. When you read the Psalms, it's for you to consume it. It's for you to fill your heart with it so that when the squeeze comes, either through conflict, through pressure, through your environment, however it comes, what comes out of you is nothing more than the constant influence you've been putting on your life. Folks, I will submit to you, my brothers and sisters, this might be easier than what you thought. We are in a world that pushes content. We have pushed content like we have never pushed content in the history of mankind. And we have created a new economy. Who would have thought 15 years ago that you can get a job paying you six figures managing social media? Who thought that that's even possible, that you can have a company and make millions of dollars helping people post pictures? We have invented an entire economy out of nowhere based on consuming content. And you're telling me you can't change? What excuse do you have? We used to have the excuse, I don't like to read. I don't like to read. Pastor, I would love to read a book on personal development, but I don't like to read. 
You should hear the excuses I get. I go to sleep when I read. I get bored when I read. I get a headache when I read. I get diarrhea when I read. I, 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 I go into a headspin when I read. I, I go back to third grade when I read. I have dyslexia, pastor. I read words backwards when I read. Now, we have audio books. And we make excuses for the audio books. And if you don't like an audio book, now you can have videos. People will just talk to you. And then guess what happened to us? The videos were too long. It's too, it's too long, Pastor. Okay. So they started making shorts and reels. And now we cut down our sermons to 30 seconds. And one brother says, it's too long. It's too long, we got to cut it down to 28 seconds because people lose their... So I want you to understand, it's not that we cannot consume consumption. We have gotten so good at consuming consumption that we need it in 10 seconds so we can move on to the next thing. My question is, in all the content that you were consuming, are you a better person? Have you developed more skills with other hours you have logged? Take your phones out. Look at your screen time. Look at your history. Look what you have been watching. You should be a genius by now. <laughs> you should have another bachelor's degree by now. But what we do is we don't hone in on what we need. We consume content now for entertainment. And we have developed constant need to be entertained, 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 entertained without growing. And we have a new problem, which is a new problem created by what we have created in technology. That people don't even know how to talk. So when you do squeeze them, we're not even eloquent anymore. Yeah. So when you know what happens when you go back to being ignorant, then you go back to sin nature. Frustration, which is the easiest thing to express. Frustration, anger, or shutdown. Just shut it all down, because we're not used to speaking to each other. We're fine consuming information, but we're not good at consuming the information that makes us better. I would challenge you to not just let the, 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 all of your social media feeds and your YouTube and all this stuff, because you know what they feed you? Those are programs that have algorithms that are programmed to feed you what you watch. So they're not going to feed you stuff that they want. It's programmed to give you what you watch. So if all you want to watch is cute cat videos, it's going to keep giving you more of that. But if you want to consume content that's going to feed your soul, it's going to continue to give you more of that. I challenge you. What is 80% of the fees that's coming to you? Does it feed you? Or does it just entertain you? Because here it's talking about that by your fruit you shall be known. And your fruit is what you put constant seed in. And you constantly feed yourself and feed yourself and feed yourself. Is it possible, my brothers and sisters, that we are malnutritioned? That we will accept a three-minute clip of a sermon and have lost the patience to sit through an entire message. Because we just don't have the patience anymore to fill this heart with gladness. If you're new, you know what you ought to do? You ought to be getting ready your playlist. There's so much better Christian artists. Man, when I was coming up and I was 19, it was so hard to get a good Christian music. It was really hard. You had to get stuff that was like 20 years back and it was like nobody wanted to listen to stuff. Now we have good modern artists, okay, that are competing. In my opinion, a lot of them are better than the stuff that's in secular. Start to build your playlist so you can feed yourself a constant stream of music that is peaceable, that feeds your soul, that gives your soul instructions. You ought to develop a tolerance that, that a 40-minute that a, a sermon is not all you can handle in a week, that you can handle more content, intelligent conversation, because once a squeeze gets on you, what's going to come out is what you have been constantly putting in. There's enough content 
for you to get better at any area of your life, but we decide to consume anything else because we're not into controlling what goes in. Controlling. You, you should be picky, just as picky as you are of your food, as picky as you are that I don't want to eat this, you should be, I don't want to hear this. I feel like eating steak. You should also be like, I feel like eating word. I, I feel like hearing something because you're going to eat from here and from here. And the Lord said, what, the food that you eat, it goes into your stomach and it goes out. But when you hear the word of God, faith comes by hearing. And I challenge you today to start to change the way that you think about this stuff and start to create menus for your ears. I want, to, I want to pray that the Lord would bless us with a deeper, with, with more of a, let me put it this way, more patience for powerful word. That we may develop a capacity to go deeper in the things of God so we can start to transform. And in that transformation process, you're not only going to get better as a person, you're going to be better to your family. Last week, we said something that we have been working on the whole week, that we should not say anything. We should not say just anything to the people that we can say anything to. Sometimes because we are so brute, we will say dumb things to the people that have become vulnerable to us. A brother who has married a woman and she trusts him with all of her heart will say things to break her because he can because she loves him so much that he will accept any that she will accept anything and this is the person you choose to break the person that has dropped their defenses this is the person you want to fight you want to fight the people that are not going to punch you back you want to fight the people that will be hurt by your words why not fight the people that will fight you back? Because human, you know what humanity likes? We like punching bags. We like to pick on people that are not our own size. We like to have unfair advantages over people. That's not godly. You know what's godly? Grace. Peace. What's godly is to treat someone the way that the Lord has treated you. Not the way you want to be treated. Because God has treated you better than what you thought you should be treated. It's a level up. Grace to those who don't deserve it. Peace to those who don't have it. And once you do that, God gives seed to the sower. Because you're a person that keeps sowing righteousness everywhere you go. Perfect people, we're not talking about you today. James was clear. If you can control your mouth, that's a perfect man. I haven't seen one yet. Now, it might be hypocritical, but I'm preaching this stuff and I got issues. Because I live in a body that is subject to sin. My soul is free. My soul has been delivered and saved. But this body of flesh is, has to obey the laws of gravity. I cannot float to heaven. Every time I wake up in the morning, gravity keeps me here. And as long as gravity keeps you on the ground, you're going to struggle with that tongue. As long as gravity keeps you on the ground, you're going to struggle with your mindset. As long as gravity keeps you on the ground, you're going to struggle in your own body with your own toxicity to try to get it out of you. That's why, as good of a Christian you are, as many times you read the Bible, can't stop reading. As many songs as we have sang every Sunday, we can't stop singing. As many times that we have fellowship and drank coffee, we can't stop fellowshipping. Because we cannot stop what is working for us. We have to constantly feed ourselves a diet, a diet, a diet. Just like we understand that we consume food and we digest it and we need to eat again, don't ever think that one word, one message is good enough for the rest of your life. 
You have to continue to consume the word of God, consume the environment of God, and consume the mindset of God. So when the squeeze gets put on you, I want you to understand that we are the only creatures that can change the flavor of the juice. A lemon cannot all of a sudden throw apple juice, but we can. We can switch our own flavor. Hello, somebody. How many of y'all was, was had bitter juice in you? Bitter. And all of a sudden, you're a little sweeter because God came in your heart. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We're the only creatures that can change our outcomes. We can, we can decide what we're going to be and change that thing. I want when I'm squeezed and I'm under pressure, I want the person on the other side of me to experience Jesus. I want the other person to go, I didn't expect that reaction. I didn't expect that reaction. I was expecting you to do this and you did this. And my only explanation is, I would have knocked you out. I would have. I would have. But this flesh one day got into the water. And I drowned that joker. So that that flesh don't say what it want to say. It doesn't do what it want to do. I want to put my thumb on this flesh every single day. Look in the mirror and say, you're going to say what I told you to say. Some of y'all need to do that. Some of you go to the bathroom, right here in this bathroom before you leave. <laughs> you're going to say what I told you to say. Shut up. You don't speak for me. I'm getting renewed day by day with the spirit of God that's living in me. Amen, somebody? Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the name of the Lord, somebody in this place is looking for deliverance. And we're about to get it. In our mind is a switch from slavery to freedom. And we got to find it and turn it on. That switch, every time we wake up in the morning, needs to be switched back. Because we have a nature that is set on self-sabotage. But we also have something that is contrary to our human nature. We have the Holy Spirit that dwells inside every believer. And so we pray, Father, that you may strengthen the spirit that is inside of us that we may submit to you because in this way we will have better outcomes. We seem for the moment satisfied when we speak out of anger and frustration, but we sit in our beds at one o'clock in the morning with tears in our eyes full of regret because we said something to a child that broke them in half. Wondering, why are we so mean? Why are we so angry? And the answer is because we are broken and we have never taken the time to heal. But the season of healing has started today. Heal, Father, the brokenhearted. Mend up the broken soul. Put ointment on the wounded mind and help us to transform once and for all in the name of Jesus. We will never be the same again. One touch from Jesus and it changes the trajectory of our life. I pray right now for revelation that those that are new to the word, that when they read it, it may be like a budding flower that hits their mind. I pray, Lord God, for freedom and deliverance from every nasty attitude that we have been subjected to. Every malcontent, malnourished, misinformation that is feeding us, every nasty bad habit of consuming content 
that makes us bitter and angry and judgmental, we cast it out now in the name of Jesus. We don't need it. We don't want it. We reject it. And we make a decision that we're going to set up like a new restaurant. We're going to set up this new menu. And we're going to decide with you as our Lord and Savior what we ought to hear, what we ought to see, what we ought to say. We do not want to be defiled anymore. We don't want to be toxic people anymore. We want to be whole and we want to be holy. Help us, O oh God, to bridle this tongue. Help us, O oh God, to not cause pain to our spouse, not cause pain to our children, not cause pain to our coworker, not have to deal and sit in the dark full of regret of our own toxicity. Change is coming in the house of God. And it first must start with us. It starts with us as individuals. And I believe, Lord God, if we start to clean up our act, then you'll start to shower us, Father, with blessings and opportunities. Some of us, oh God, have been closed doors, experienced closed doors because our mouth is out of control. Give us control. Help us, O oh God, to bridle this tongue. Help us, O oh God, to bridle this tongue. Help us to bridle this tongue. Help us, O oh God, to get our mouth together to speak the words that you have told us to speak. To stop having, Lord God, this itch to speak when it is our time to listen. Help us, O oh God, to not find conflict when it is time of peace. We are not at war. But some of us are programmed for war and we never shut off. We never transition to peace. But I believe, Lord God, this word is for all of those that have been stuck on warfare. And now, Lord God, have trouble transitioning to peace. We need your word now more than ever, Lord. The world has become angry. We have found a way to be upset about everything. But change is coming to the house of the Lord. I pray, Lord God, peace over every family. I pray resolve over every situation. I pray healing, Lord God, over every broken mind, every bitter heart, every wounded soul. Let it be so in the name of Jesus. If on today you have recognized, you're watching online, you're hearing this room, you recognize that you need a change and you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to invite you in this moment to do so. In the book of Romans, it taught us that if a man believes with his heart and confesses with his mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he will receive salvation and as a consequence of salvation, receive eternal life. Jesus told us and he gave us a great commission Go out unto the world. Those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. With the mouth, one confesses, but with the heart, belief is made in a transition to salvation. And I want to invite you to pray. We're all going to do it together so you don't feel alone or singled out. Sometimes we need a help to get in. And let's pray this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive you into my heart. Come into my life today and make me whole. I have been dealing with situations that I have not been able to control. Help me to become new. Help me to become peaceable. To be the child of God that you have called me to be. I am not weak. I am bold. I am not weak. I am strong. And I will serve you all the days of my life. My strength will come from you and not from anger. My power will come from you and not from frustration. From this day forward, I will be free in Jesus' name.
Clap your hands and give God praise if you believe it. Hallelujah. As we go, I want to challenge you this week. The Lord is preparing us and working us up to a state where he wants total surrender. But before you give total surrender, he has to fill you with joy. And by filling you with joy, it might sound crazy, but sometimes he has to break you. In that breaking process, there are certain things that you have learned along the way that are not helping you to receive what God is giving you. And I don't want you to think that coming up for prayer and me laying hands on you, I don't want you to receive that as a shortcut. There is no shortcut to deliverance. Jesus said that if we would cast out a devil and the house is clean, he said that you will risk that seven worse than him will come and abide that empty house. It isn't good enough to just be clean and to empty yourself of toxicity if you don't have anything to replace it with. You got to be full at all times. You can never be left empty because if you are empty, you can just kick out all bad stuff out of your diet. You got to eat something. You can't just stop eating junk food. You'll die. I know everybody said, well, you got to eat this and you got to eat right. But sometimes if you have not developed a taste for healthy food, yeah. some, some folks don't understand. Sometimes you got to eat the salad and the chips. Because <laughs> if you just cut out all junk food and just go cold turkey to eat in salad, it ain't gonna last very, very long. And that's why some of y'all come to church. <laughs> Hello, somebody. You come to church, you cut out all the junk food, you eat clean 100%, and then the salad place don't see you no more. <laughs> when you're in a diet, that salad place, you become the best customer for two weeks. And then you don't buy none from them for nine months. That's what happens at church. People want to change their diet, they come and they say, this is the right place I got to be. But then you get so starved for them chips. I ain't giving you permission to do that. I'm, what I'm saying is transition. It ain't nothing healthy about doing a culture shock and then leave yourself empty because then you start, you stop eating right, you stop living right. And then the taste for the world comes back three times stronger. Touch your neighbor said, pace yourself. Pace yourself. Pace yourself. Pace yourself. Take it easy on yourself. Because you only have one life to live. And you better get this one right. If you get this one right, you get to live forever. Yes. Father, as we leave this place, we dismiss, Lord God, from each other, but never from your presence. You will follow us wherever we go. Some tough decisions have to be made, but I pray they may be made with wisdom. I pray, Lord God, that the people of God, the new believers, may pace themselves. Connect with believers that know what it is to live a life that is holy, but at the same time, something that is doable, that is long-term. And if it's going to be long-term, it might be slow. And it might cause everyone around them to have to increase in patience and tolerance. But if we get this right, then we will inherit eternal life. I believe a little patience is all right. I believe a little grace. It'll work just fine. And if we can work together. We will make it to the other side of the Jordan. Celebrating that we have followed Jesus Christ. And we will never turn back, but we will live in victory every single day. So as we leave this place, we live with joy. We live with optimism. We live knowing that we have an opportunity to be made whole again. I pray for all those that you have called to work the kingdom. That you may reignite a passion and a fire inside of them to do what they were called to do. That they may go back to reading 
to consuming the content of soldiers and warriors in the kingdom to revamp their excitement and their energy to go back to being the person that God has called. Maybe they have to dust off some of their mindsets, dust off some leadership abilities, dust off some skills, but ultimately we are marching forward and not backwards. And we are excited about becoming the people that you have predestined us to be. We're excited about seeing where this leads and we will do it if you permit us. We pray all these things in Jesus name. Amen, amen. and amen. Hug somebody on the way out. Give them some love. God bless you.